first, again, I would like to say that crucial are the terms that I think you both mentioned, all this extra legal space, unlawful combatants, and so on and so on. The paradox is that I think we should uh, read these terms as strictly connected to universal human rights. To what? I have nothing against universal human rights. What I'm opposed to is how the reference to universal human rights is de facto used in today's ideological struggles. That in order to sustain, support within the space of ruling ideology, universal human rights, you have to construct a space which is no, not, no longer the space of the enemy, in this sense, enemy to whom the rules apply, either Geneva Convention and so on, but you have to create to what the great American thinker and politician Dick Cheney referred to as the gray zone once, you know, like we have to do something discreetly, don't ask us around uh, about it and so on and so on. Here I would say things are even uh, more complex than it may appear because what I find really terrifying is that concepts like unlawful combatants are becoming legal categories. Now, I'm not a utopian here. Let me be, bru and I will maybe shock some of you, brutally open. I can well imagine a situation where, well, I cannot promise you in advance that I wouldn't torture someone. Let's imagine these ridiculous situations where a bad guy has my young daughter and then I have in my hands a guy and I know that that guy knows where my daughter is. Well, maybe out of despair I would have tortured her, him, whatever. What I absolutely oppose to is to legalize this. I think if out of despair I do something like this, it should remain something unacceptable, you know, that I did out of despair. I am, I, what I am afraid of is that this system gets institutionalized, as it were, where all this will, you know, because we know what is at the end of the road. I had a polemic, just an exchange in New York Times with uh, Alan Dershowitz, who wants legalization of torture. And I read one of his proposals, it's an obscenity. You will have doctors, let's say, just a friendly, to scare you a little bit example. Amy and me are, the torturers, you, somebody has to play this role, will be tortured, no? <laughs> so, let's say we call a doctor who, it's an obscenity, who... Speak for who, yourself, Slava. Sorry? Speak for yourself. Okay, sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. okay. No, You're but you know what I'm torturer. saying, who, who investigates you and determines. We can, you can torture him to that degree if, and so on, and so on. For me, what's horrible is not, of course, it is torture at such. But it's even more obscene, this uh, normalization of torture. Which is why, yes, more than you, I mean this respectively, Manning is for me the hero. Because you have a certain moment of glory and so on and so on. That poor guy who, for me, is, did something extraordinary. You know how difficult are these decisions, that simple elementary morality prevails over legal considerations and so on. I think that, I hope I'm not a utopian, I, I even, pro like, don't you have any of these organs who propose candidates for Nobel Peace Prize? That would be a nice crazy movement. If uh, there is a person who deserves Nobel Peace Prize today, it's Manning or people like that. This, you know why? No, no, I'm not bluffing here simple, ordinary people, and I'm not even idealizing him. There are many examples that I know of, ordinary people who were not anything special, they are not saints, but all of a sudden they see something, like probably he, if he is the one, uh, saw all these documents and something told him, sorry, I will not be pushed more, I have to do something here. This is so precious today because it also goes against a note which is in a way true, but it's exploited by our enemies. This idea, ideology today is cynical, people are totally duped, and so on. No, they are not. I prefer, I prefer her to play a little bit of simple moralism. From time to time, there are ethical, uh, ethical, uh, ethical miracles. There are people who still care, and so on, and so on. 
This is very important because, you know, like, let's not leave this domain of a care for simple, dignified, ethical acts to agencies like Catholic Church and so on. Who are they to talk about? Who are they to talk about it? We, the left, should rehabilitate this. I know it doesn't sound very postmodern or cynical. This idea that there are out there quite ordinary guys, nothing special, but who all of a sudden, as if in a miracle, do something wonderful. That's almost, I would say, our only hope today. <laughs> Sorry for that. Sorry for that example. Don't be too mad. Speaking on that, uh one of the difficulties for alleged sources, uh, and actually we have another one in prison, which um, has received very little recognition, which is the case of Rudolf Elmer, uh, who's in prison in Switzerland for allegedly revealing uh, secret bank information. Um, there's no uh, trace to us, but that is the allegation that has been investigated. Um, is that if they put up their hands and say, yes, yes, it was me, uh, it makes it very easy to defend them in a moral way. It makes it very easy to shower them with awards. Um, but until they do that, their, their, their defense is that they didn't do it. So um, it is very hard for, for us to, um, to start uh, praising people because inherent in that praise is uh, we would be alleging that they are, are guilty of the, of the offense. Speaking of banks, Julian, um, you mentioned a while ago that you had a good deal of documents on Bank of America, but they haven't been released. Are you planning to release them? There's a complication with those documents and another group of documents. So we, we are under a type of blackmail in relation to these documents. Um, that is very, that will be dealt with over time, but it is quite difficult uh, to deal with at the moment. So, I don't want to specify what type of blackmail that is because it might make it harder to address uh, the situation. But it is, um, it is perhaps something like people might guess. Uh, that <laughs> I, you know, there's a range of possibilities, and it's probably the first or second possibility if you're, if you're guessing at these things. Well, let's talk about the beginning of WikiLeaks. Tell us about how you founded it, named it, and what your hopes were at the time, and if at this point um, you have been disappointed by what you've been able to accomplish or amazed by it. WikiLeaks, how it started. I think I am amazed by it, of course. I mean, who couldn't be? Um, it, it's an extraordinary time that I have lived through and to see uh, many of your dreams and ideals come into practice. That said, um, I think we're only about a hundredth of the way there in terms of what we have to re release and discover and collect and, and put into people's heads and uh, solidify in the historical record. Uh, we need a, a cable gate uh, for the CIA, we need a cable gate for the SVR, we need a, a cable gate of the New York Times, actually. Um, all, the, all the stories that have been suppressed and how they've been managed. And once we start getting that sort of volume and concretize uh, and protect um, the rights of everyone to communicate with one another, which to me is the, is the basic ingredient of civilized life. It is um, not the right to speak. What does, the, what does it mean to have the right to speak if you're on the moon and there's no one around? It, it doesn't mean anything. Um, rather, the right to speak comes from our rights to know. And the two of us together, someone's right to speak and someone's right to know, produce a right to communicate. And so that is the grounding uh, structure uh, for all that we treasure about civilized life. And by civilized, I don't mean industrialized. I mean people collaborating to not do uh, the, d the dumb thing, 
to instead learn from previous experiences and learn from each other to pull each other, pull with each other together in order to get through the life that we live in a, in a less adverse way. So that quest to protect the historical record and enable everyone to be a contributor to the historical record uh, is something that I have been involved in uh, for about 20 years in one way or another. So that means protecting people who contribute to our shared intellectual record. And it also means protecting publishers and encouraging distribution of historical record to everyone who needs to know about it. After all, an historical record that has something interesting in it that you can't find is no record at all. So that long-term vision is something that I developed in various ways. And I saw in around 2006 that there was a way of achieving justice through this process uh, that could, could be realized using the intellectual and uh, social capital that I had available. And so that's quite a, a complex plan. You, you should perhaps read, there's a couple of essays on WikiLeaks that go into this uh, in more detail. So, to, to, so to, to pull all this together was a difficult thing to do. It's, um, and to plan it out and to marshal the resources and to build um, not only an ideology that people could support and were encouraged by and the sources were encouraged by, um, but that people would defend. And it's, it's one of the, I think it's extremely interesting that although twice this venue was cancelled, not this venue, sorry, twice this, the venue that we had rented for this was cancelled, including at the Institute uh, uh, for Education from the University of London, under the basis it would be too controversial. And so we, that's why we ended up at, the trots, at, this, at this venue. That despite that, that actually, Slavoj Zizek, myself and Amy Goodman, have been managed, managed to pack out nearly 2,000 people in London on a Saturday um, at 25 pounds a seat. So I see that as extremely encouraging. On, on the one hand, we have this sort of the everyday tawdry institutional uh, censorship of saying that something is too controversial and therefore you can't hold it in an institute of education. Um, on the other hand, uh, all of you came. And I'm not sure that that would have happened five years ago. In fact, I'm pretty sure that wouldn't have happened five years ago. And that both of those things wouldn't have happened five years ago. So that when I said before that censorship is always an opportunity, and censorship reveals something that is positive about a society, and a society with no censorship is in a very bad state. That the, the, if you like, the censorship of not giving us this venue so easily um, is also related to why you are all here. It is the other side of the coin that people are worried that change is, po that change is possible and you're here because you think that change is possible and you're probably right. Um, so that's been a very interesting journey to see that 